I'm Tony Ruiz, contributing editor at Gold Derby, here with composer Chris Bowers, who, if you're watching television at all, chances are his music is featured in something that you watch, because <laughs> he's kind of everywhere all at once. So <laughs> my first question, Chris, and we were just talking how, you know, you have a two-month-old, um, <laughs> when do you rest and how do you, <laughs> how do you how do you in seriousness how do you balance all of these uh these various projects yeah i mean i think it's a, a number of things one it's definitely like uh you know the fact that a lot of these things are happening over the course of like a year's time or months and you know i'm working on them at separate times and they come out at the same time and all of that and then also i got really lucky this year where a lot of the projects i was working on like some of them have very, very little score. Some of them are using score from previous seasons. And so um, it's worked out where I was able to really put my focus in specific places. And um, yeah, I, I feel like it, it somehow is working out. And, and also I think the lack of sleep prepared me for parenthood, <laughs> honestly. <yeah. laughs> um, so let's, let's just jump right in. Um, the first, the, the first thing I kind of want to talk about actually is, is, is Colin in black and white, because that, that score is is so I think is such a it's such an undertone of the whole documentary it just kind of like you know it provides such a foundation for it um and in documentaries I mean we don't often think of the score uh in in documentary filmmaking so so what was your kind of approach with that particular project yeah so for that project I remember when Ava first told me about it and talked about her thinking with even the, the songs in it, she really wanted to make sure that we felt uh, that era and we felt Colin's introduction to black culture, especially through the context of music. And so once she told me that, and I just really went into my own, you know, nostalgia to think about all the records that I really loved from like early 2000s that uh, I listened to when I was in middle school and all of that. Um, the first thought was to find a way to mine those tracks for uh, a palette for a lot of like the hip hop elements and any of the um, uh, kind of like light moments with the family. A lot of the instrumentation is really inspired by early 2000s R&B and hip hop. And then the strings and all of that were, you know, trying to um, uh, be with Colin in any of the more emotional, quiet moments. Um, and the other thing I talked to her about was, you know, how we would see this theme of his uh, develop and mature over the course of the show as we're seeing him develop and mature. And I think the show is so brilliant and how it balances this documentary style with these reenactments that feel like you're watching, you know, a, a regular narrative TV show. Um, and once you see how he's developing and how he's embracing not only Black culture, but also his, um, his idea of of uh, standing in his power and all these different things um, that juxtaposed with the context that we're given from today's Colin of, of you know, why things are systemically the way that they are. It really was something uh, great to sink my teeth into thematically with the score to try to develop his theme from in the beginning being tied to the way his mom sees him to by the end being tied to the way he sees himself standing in his power. Yeah, and, and one of the things that I find you know, so kind of fascinating is, is the way the, and, I, and you hit on it, the way the music kind of transforms as that journey progresses. And, you know, not just how his family sees him, but how he is perceived. There's a perception thing that I think is also a big part of that. Am I, am I misreading that? No, a hundred percent. I mean, again, it's, it's um, something that kind of developed as I was working on it, but the first time we meet Colin, we hear this theme that feels like, oh, this is Colin's theme, but it's actually, in my mind, the theme for uh, the way his mom sees him. And then by the end of episode one, when he uh, has this feeling of, of frustration with his hair and, and how his, his family sees his hair, and um, there's a cue before that, where it's called uh, Raised by Rebels, where today's Colin talks about, you know, Black culture and how we've done everything from like, you know, changing the way that people think about style to music and art and all these different things. And there's a cue that comes in there that then becomes Colin's theme through the course of the season. So it's like, as the season goes on, uh, we hear less and less this uh, theme with how his mom sees him, or it's, it's um, you know, moments only when, when we're actually seeing the two of them interact. But anytime Colin is really stepping into his own power, we get this other theme that by the end of the show, 
uh, there's like the six minute cue that that's, uh, you know, the full embodiment of that theme. Uh, so, and then you go from something like that to say something like DMZ, which, yeah. <laughs> which, you know, has similarities, but still to me has a completely different, you know, I think the word you used was palette. Um, um, is that something that you, you actually, you strive for? Do you, do you try to find that variety? Yeah. Cause I think that for me, I, I search for projects or, uh, try to stay open to projects that are going to challenge me to, um, stretch different aspects of the musicality that I want to develop in myself. Like, I feel like I've always wanted to work on something like this because of my love for scores that have this, you know, graphic novel kind of scope and size to it, but also I'm a huge fan of like Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross and like that sound uh, is something that I don't really get that many opportunities to explore um, outside of the context of my own music, like my own music, uh, especially I've been working on lately has a lot more of that kind of grittier sound to it. Um, but it's something that I have always been a huge fan of trying to develop and grow within myself. And so having that opportunity was really exciting. And, and, and also like having people, um, there's a really incredible synth uh, player that's been a friend of mine for a while named Nick Semrad, who did, like, basically I gave him a huge playlist and was like, make me a bunch of custom synth patches uh, inspired by this playlist. And so a lot of the synth sounds are like, synth sounds that he designed for me or same thing with my friend Brian Bender, who's an incredible producer, like having him create sounds. So a lot of it was like having these incredible synth designers and, and producers uh, collaborate with me to create the palette and then being able to just kind of play with that sound. It, it, there's almost kind of like a, 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 an industrial feel to it that, that just kind of like, I was listening to it and I was like, Whoa, <laughs> <laughs> did, 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 did that, immediately come into your head to go for that type of sound yeah for sure you, the first thoughts i had were I, I this playlist i made was like all of this music from um uh, from new york city specifically that felt really angsty and really angry and and uh felt like you know this dystopian dis destructed place that we're seeing um and then my thought was like what would it sound like to feel and hear the memory of all of that music rather than like trying to quote that music specifically. But like, again, a lot of the synth sounds or synth sounds that are like inspired by this playlist of New York bands. And then um, uh, when I first watched the first episode and seeing, you know, like these buildings that have collapsed or like all of these things, I think it was wanting to feel the way that looks um, in, in like a tactile way. And so I think that kind of developed this like more industrial sound. And then at the same time, juxtaposing that with, with really, really quiet moments. Like I remember listening to even the temp music and some of the scenes where almost walking around the streets and it felt like it was too, uh, it felt like the thing that was crazy to me is seeing New York, especially, you know, living there for 10 years, like seeing New York in this really quiet, overgrown, like, you know, destructive way. I felt like I want to just hear that. Like, what would it sound like to be walking? Like, that feels really eerie to me to be in a city like New York and not hear anything. And so wanting the score in those moments to be really, really sparse and then have the loudness and, and more um, uh, robust parts of the score come in when when we're matching the emotion of what we're seeing with the characters on screen. And then, of course, you know, of course, we have to talk about Bridgerton because, you know, that that is you know, 180 degree difference from, from <laughs> anything that we've talked about so far, or is it, is it, is the process different? Is your thought pattern different when you're doing something that veers more into the classical? You know, it is isn't. it isn't. I think that for me, the thing that I, I had got a huge, what I feel is a compliment from a friend of mine when I was talking to him the other day, where he said that like, here's all these different projects that I work on and he can always tell it's me because of how strong the thematic development is. And for me, that feels like what's what's consistent through all of it is like, I'm always trying to find a way to, uh, you know, find these really strong themes with the story or the characters and represent them musically and then develop them through the course of the show. And the only thing that's different is the palette. But like, if you were to, like, sometimes I play some of my themes on piano and they start to sound really similar when you like take away all of the, you know, the, the trappings of the the clothing or the facade of the the instrumentation and all of that and so 
for me, it, 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 is, it is a really, really similar process in terms of how I go about writing. It's usually just, again, focusing on themes and emotion and writing from that place and then putting that into whatever palette I'm working on in that moment. So with something like Bridgerton, I think, one, it was really helpful to be able to have, you know, season one to go off of in terms of like the palette and all of that and, and not changing that at all. And then it was literally just thinking about uh, the themes for this season, like what we're going to develop and the fact that we have this opportunity with a show that's going to now focus on completely different characters or different aspects of characters. So uh, before we even started, I started to think about like, what does the Lady Whistledown theme look like now that we know who that is? Like, what does uh, Penelope's theme sound like when she's acting as Lady Whistledown? Uh, because like in season one, her, her the only cue that I was kind of considering her theme was like looking at her as um, uh, this young woman who's trying to find love and finding difficulty with that. And now we, we know this other side of her. So, you know, what does that sound like? And of course, Antony and Kate's theme. And with that theme, I wrote it initially thinking of uh, like the fact that there's no way this love triangle was going to play out like well, essentially. And like, and, and so the first iteration of it, there's kind of this like tragic sound, sad sounding theme that I thought if I could find a way to like introduce this as this thing that feels dangerous and feels like, you know, taboo and, and something that, that we're really unsure of, but then find a way to develop it in a way where once that love is actually able to be acknowledged, it kind of explodes in this really romantic way, then that would be a successful trajectory for that theme. And so, yeah, coming up with new themes for, for Bridgerton this season was a lot of fun and then figuring out how to uh, combine that with the sound of the show from last season and also how anything from last season would kind of be, you know, reworked this year. Yeah, that's what I, that was going to be what I was going to ask you next is is when you're coming back to to a show like this that has such a specific sound, how do you balance wanting to do something, you know, different at, while still maintaining kind of the same palette that that goes through the show? Yeah, a lot of it is like following the lead of, you know, the showrunner Chris Van Dusen and also, you know, the producers Betsy and Tom. I feel like uh, they have always, they've never steered me wrong when it comes to like what would be best to do in a certain scenario. And there are times where Chris was very clear. He's always actually very clear about wanting something very new and fresh for this year and times where he was like, I really love the way that this cue from last year works here. Um, and so really following his lead, like I remember talking to him about uh, there's a moment in, in episode one where we start to hear uh, the theme that played when Daphne is, is uh, you know, uh, deemed the diamond of the season last year that plays under Edwina. And for a split second, I was like, wait, that feels really weird to me because like now I'm hearing this theme that was for Daphne under Edwina. Um, but then talking to him about like the fact that Edwina now is the, the diamond of the season or thinking about it that way, I think all of a sudden made me feel like, okay, now I can I can see how this theme can be revised and, and refreshed in this season with her and so yeah again a lot of it's just following the the guidance of of Chris and Betsy and Tom in terms of like what elements from last year really felt good that we want to revisit or we want to uh you know play on the nostalgia of how it felt to watch the show for the first time last year and how much of it is wanting to try something very do, uh, new and different has has the uh you know as we're emerging from from the pandemic to a certain extent, has that changed how you how you create these scores and how the scores ult are ultimately kind of like assembled? Like, are you back with live orchestras and that sort of thing? You know, it depends. For Bridgerton, we actually decided to stick with the um, process from last year, mm -hmm. uh, in big part because we were so happy with the sound of the show. It felt like, why change that and, and you know risk it sounding different essentially. And so the process for that show is, it's exactly the same. We're still recording everybody remotely. It's still a small ensemble that's laying, layering itself to be this large or orchestra. Um, and then for some projects I am going in, like, especially I'm trying to think most of the shows actually have all been um, either this remote process or in the box. I mean, with something like DMZ, there really isn't any, uh, other than like some of the string moments, which we did in a similar way remotely, everything is is production. So all that's like, you know, since and in the box. And then for uh, a show like Colin in black and white, all of the strings are actually 
uh, Miguel Atwood Ferguson, this incredible violin or violist that that is incredible at layering himself and improvising and stuff like that. So that's all the strings you hear in that are all him just finding a way to to uh, you know be an entire string section by himself. Um, so I feel like I have been going back into the studio for certain projects, but for all of the TV shows I worked on this year, uh, it was either doing this remote process or and or it was a lot of like production and, and more like sound design -y type of scores. And you're also, of course, doing during, doing songwriting too, you know, especially the track for, for Dear White People. Is the process different for you when you know it's going to be like an actual song versus a score? I feel like yes and no. For me, the the emotion and the and what the story is is still always you know the north star but i think with a song obviously it's more so thinking about like how is this going to function as uh, a song structurally because like you know it's not going to be as through composed as a piece of score and and um with a song like together all the way like the the first conversation i had with justin was uh he told me he wanted a song that uh, obviously would fit in the context of this this season where we're doing like a 90s musical so uh, like having all of this music that that feels like it's specific to that time period and then having a song that feels like it kind of is a nod to that period as well but he mentioned it as like a song where we would hear it earlier in the season in these um, incidental ways where it's like on an ad or somebody's commenting on it and it feels like oh that cheesy song from back in the day that we used to hear all the time and having that develop into this moment where the whole cast sings and it has this emotional effect because now we're actually listening to the lyrics and, and actually really hearing the song in a different way. And so uh, that was really interesting to me. And, and the first thing I did was like, look at a combination of songs from that time period and also like the Beatles. Cause I feel like the, the feeling he wanted from the song to me just felt like the Beatles are masters at, at that feeling. And so my first process was like thinking about those emotions and trying to come up with a chord progression that could feel that way. So like the chord progression that I came up with is directly inspired by, you know, songs like Man in the Mirror or um, uh, All You Need Is Love, like all, all these different, these, these songs that um, uh, have a certain feeling to them. Uh, and then once I had a chord progression, I shared that with Saida Garrett and she wrote the lyrics and, and melody. And we did this kind of during the thickness of the, the pandemic in a, in a time where um, I don't think Saida and I met in person at all working on, on the song. <laughs> we actually like, like I wrote the chord progression. I sent her the chord progression. She wrote the top line and the lyrics and sent me back like uh, a demo of it that was pretty fully fleshed out that we met on Zoom and played through it and talked through like moments where, oh, like, you know, that chord, maybe you hold that chord for two more beats or, you know, maybe this melody isn't the best option here and like kind of went back and forth there and then uh, re-recorded it. And um, and then that was our demo. And then I worked with the the actors to record the the final version. I'm exhausted just thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, Chris, it's always you know so fascinating to just hear about your process, and I and I love I love you know always getting the chance to talk to you. Um, everybody, go to goldderby.com, make your predictions for the Emmys, and stay tuned for interviews with more contenders throughout the season. Chris Bowers, uh, so great to see you again. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Tony. Good to see you too.